In my early 20s, I stumbled upon a set of principles and ethics that would fundamentally change how I approached gardening, social justice, and environmental activism. These principles, which were inspired by indigenous systems like managed prairies and food forests, are collectively known as permaculture. They offer a holistic perspective on creating sustainable, regenerative systems that make human communities an integrated part of our ecosystems. At first, these principles were exciting new theoretical concepts for me to experiment with, and I soon started a communal permaculture garden in my neighborhood to give them a try. But a few years after that, those principles became a very real lifeline for me. At age 27, I found myself grappling with debilitating pain and fatigue from several overlapping conditions. Suddenly, activities as simple as walking to the garden became huge undertakings. I had to reevaluate everything I thought I knew about what I could achieve, in the garden and in everything else. Unexpectedly, my permaculture training became a toolkit for adapting to my new reality. After all, the grand design of a permaculture system is to keep resources cycling through it with minimal ongoing effort of human energy. Human energy, which is a resource in itself. I realized I could use the mental tools permaculture had given me to craft garden and community systems that were aligned with the amount of energy I had to offer. Today, I call my particular application of the permaculture principles gentle gardening because it's gardening that is easy both on my body and my nervous system. In this video, I'd like to share the insights I've gained in the hope that they can help other gardeners who struggle with disability or chronic illness or mental energy and executive dysfunction. I'll describe each principle, then explore how it can be adapted for sustainable low energy gardening. The first principle is observe and interact. In permaculture, we're encouraged to observe a piece of land for a full year before we begin to plan our design. That's practical advice when a full permaculture design might include big projects like building earthworks to change the flow of water or big expenditures like fruit trees. Even on a smaller scale, it's wise to avoid decisions that are expensive or irreversible until we've seen our space in all its seasons. As gentle gardeners, observation can save us from committing our scarce resources before we have all the information. Here are some things to consider. What plants are already growing in your space? Maybe a previous tenant of this land planted perennials that will return every year, or annual flowers that keep reseeding themselves. If it snows in winter, which part of the yard thaws first and which thaws last? Do you get any flooding in spring? What kind of wildlife visits regularly? What plants or infrastructure do they interact with? Even once your garden is established, regular intentional observation can help you continue to make wise and efficient decisions. Long and careful observation once saved me from rash action when I noticed an explosion of grubs and beetles in my garden. An image search told me they were plant-devouring Japanese beetles, but I was suspicious. They were mostly down in the soil and not up in the leaves, and I didn't think that behavior matched with what I'd heard about Japanese beetles. So I kept watching and researching until I finally realized what they were. Dung beetles! They had come in with some manure that wasn't fully composted, and all I had to do was rake that manure back into a pile until the beetles had finished processing it. Whenever I think about that day, I'm relieved that I took the time to double and triple check. I would have wasted a ton of energy and anxiety if I had believed that I had a Japanese beetle infestation to deal with. Observation is so important that I have made it my only must-do task on days when my energy is really low. I walk slowly around the garden and either make notes or take pictures with my phone to record issues that I see that will need dealing with once I feel better. I don't try to solve anything that day, but noting them down means I'll know what needs doing once I'm up to it. This way, I catch problems before they become too much to handle. It also stops my anxious mind from perceiving the garden as some kind of daunting unknown when I have a long run of bad days. If I stay away too long, I start to think that the garden will be so far gone by the time I get back to it that I might as well just give up now. My observation practice is calming because it means I know exactly what's going on and what I'll eventually need to do. The second principle is catch and store energy. 
This principle might sound like a prompt to install solar panels, but it's much broader than that. Catching and storing energy can mean lots of things, like capturing rainwater uphill from your garden so that gravity can do the work during the next dry spell. It can mean planting your garden against a stone wall or integrating stones into the design so that they can catch heat during the day and release it in the evenings, which makes your garden a little warmer than the surrounding climate. And it can mean using our own energy, when we have it, to do tasks that will continue to serve us when we've later run out. I used a good energy day in the spring of 2021 to lay out a soaker hose through all of my garden beds and bury it in mulch. For the rest of the season, all I had to do to water was connect it and turn it on. But the next year, I failed to prioritize that task. Pretty soon, there were so many plants in the way that laying out the soaker hose became a task that was, in itself, too daunting. I ended up having to water manually all season, or more accurately, I failed to water a lot of the time and left my plants to fend for themselves. You'd better believe that the next year I prioritized laying out that soaker hose. The third principle is obtain a yield. This principle can be eye-opening for new students of permaculture. If asked, what yield will your farm produce? The answer seems pretty obvious. Food to eat, maybe cut flowers to sell, but yields can be a lot more than that. There are also the plant trimmings you might feed to chickens, or the fiber plants grown for cordage, legumes that you grow purely for the nitrogen they fix in the soil, bamboo or coppice trees that you grow for poles. If your site design leads to rainwater infiltrating into the soil better, you might see dry wells and creek beds refilling, and that's another kind of yield. As gentle gardeners, we may very well be interested in those yields, but we're conscious of the importance of other ones too. A garden that is exactly the right size for us to tend without overdoing things can yield healthful exercise and a sense of well-being. Flowers can bring contentment and joy. Sharing our garden with others can bring social connection. Intentionally centering those kinds of yields can remove the pressure we might otherwise feel about producing bountiful food or perfect beauty. I like to grow plants that will yield materials to help me express myself creatively. I use daylilies to make twine and baskets. I dry herbs for tea and cooking. I save seeds to give as gifts. And I press flowers and foliage for homemade cards. I get so much joy and satisfaction out of this that I consider these yields to be some of the most important ones that I produce. The fourth principle is apply self-regulation and accept feedback. Even if a permaculture designer does spend a whole year observing their space before creating their design for it, that design won't be perfect right away. And wherever there's an element that isn't working well, the living things on the site will provide feedback. Not by filling out a customer satisfaction survey, although that would be great. But an attentive designer will see that their tomatoes have yellowing leaves, or the pond they designed isn't filling with water, or their squashes are wilting and getting devoured by beetles. In response, the designer can look for ways to keep the moisture in the tomato soil more consistent. They can change their water harvesting strategy. They can give some shade to the squash to see if relieving one stress will make them more able to stand up to the beetles. Now, what about listening to feedback from our own bodies? That's a skill that everyone should cultivate, but it's especially important for those of us with disabilities or chronic illness or reduced interoception. That's the way we understand the signals our body sends us to tell us its sensations and needs. If gardening under the hot sun quickly exhausts us, we can make a point of going out earlier or later to avoid the heat of midday. If we hate staking tomatoes so much that it never gets done or worse, prevents us from going out into the garden at all, we can grow something else next year or choose sturdy, determinate varieties that don't need as much staking. If we find that our energy is getting critically depleted before we're aware of it, we can set timers to remind us to take a break, sit down in the shade, drink some water, and pay attention to how our body feels. In my own garden, I no longer wait to get tired before I take a rest. It is way too easy to say, oh, I'll stop at the end of this row and then get distracted by another task. I actually needed help learning to identify the cues my body gives me to say I'm straining it. I wore a Fitbit for a year because my doctor wanted me to keep my heart rate under a certain level. 
over time of wearing it, I started to realize I got certain sensations around the time when my heart rate started to speed up. These days, I've tuned my mind to pay better attention to them so that I can stop as soon as I start to feel those sensations. But it's even better to stop before I feel them at all. The fifth principle is use and value renewable resources and services. This was the principle that first caught my attention as an environment-obsessed young person. I had always been uncomfortable with the fact that gardening, an activity that brings you closer to nature, so often included products that depleted and polluted the earth. Things like plastic cloth to suppress weeds or quarried stone that gets shipped long distances. In fact, today gardening and agriculture are heavily dependent on non-renewable resources in the name of efficiency. There's diesel for machinery, plastic for weed barriers, even soil additives that, while natural in and of themselves, are being produced unsustainably for a mass market. It takes a high level of awareness to avoid all these things, so this principle stands as a good reminder. Now, for most people, human energy is one of the most renewable resources around, but for those of us with chronic fatigue or a similar condition, it is very scarce indeed. We can't afford to waste it on activities that don't provide a return. So this principle can stand as a reminder to us to pay attention to which activities make us eager to return to them and which ones only deplete us. Before committing to any garden decisions, we can ask ourselves, is this task going to require a big burst of energy? And if yes, is it gonna require that once or repeatedly? We need to be honest with ourselves about our ability to commit to repeated high energy activities. But on the other hand, we can seek out activities that leave us feeling mentally or spiritually energized, even if our bodies do need to rest. I consider the energy I use fussing over tomato seedlings every spring to be a renewable resource because it brings me joy and motivation every time. But on the other hand, washing out the plastic seedling trays I use is not because that is a chore I despise. A soil blocker was the perfect solution for me. It lets me grow my seedlings without the non-renewable resource of plastic pots and without the loathsome chore of washing them. The sixth principle is produce no waste. At first glance, this principle might seem like a burden, maybe even an accusation. We already know we should be using renewable resources, but do you know how hard it is to buy gardening supplies without plastic? But with a permaculture mindset, producing less waste can be empowering, even freeing, and counterintuitively, it can help us do less work. Because this is simply a way of looking at the cycle from the other side. What is waste? It's any matter produced by our system that is not then used by another part of our system. It's anything we have to cart away or store or get rid of. Cow feces is waste if it lands on a concrete floor, but in a field, it's a nursery for insects and fertility for the soil. Potato peels are waste in most kitchens, but for somebody raising hens, they're a treat for the flock. Once we spot the waste in our own gardens, we can start looking for ways to weave it back into a seamless cycle that will save us work and resources. Do you cart plant trimmings all the way across the garden? Why not start a compost heap right next to it? Do you buy plant ties and bagged soil? Cut your bags into strips and you'll have a big supply of ties. Pay attention to anything you find yourself removing from the garden and see if you can turn it into a benefit. In my garden, weeds are never waste. I use the energy-saving chop and drop method for weed management. Unless a weed is particularly virulent, I simply snip it off close to the base and let it fall on the ground. Now it's free mulch. In fact, it's often a desire for more mulch that leads me to do weed control in the first place. This way, unless a plant is diseased or full of seeds that I don't want, I never have to use my precious energy to carry it away. The seventh principle is design from pattern to details. This principle works hand in hand with observe and interact. Keep your eye on the big picture, it tells us. Don't get lost in the minutia. Here are some things to ask yourself to start looking for patterns. How does sunlight move across your garden as the day progresses? What paths does water take when it rains? Where do you, or other humans, or other animals prefer to walk? If we design our garden with these patterns in mind, then we can take advantage of them instead of wasting precious energy by fighting against them. 
Heat-seeking plants can be grown in the places that get the most sun. Rainwater can be directed toward a mulch-filled depression at the edge of the garden so that it will soak in slowly and fill the surrounding soil with moisture. Flowers that need constant deadheading can be grown on the path to the front door. I rent a little slice of land that was parceled off from a cattle farm. Members of the farm family live on either side of me, and both households have a dog from the same litter. These canine brothers like to cross my yard to visit each other, and it was their habits that informed the structures I built around my garden. When my garden had no fence, I found their paw prints walking straight through it. But they respected visual barriers like a propped up stick, so I knew I didn't have to exhaust myself installing an impenetrable fence. Some casual open structures did the trick. The eighth principle is each element performs many functions. In permaculture, any part of your garden that is doing just one job is an inefficient use of resources. If we refer back to the idea of an ecosystem, we can see that a tree acts as a home for squirrels, a food source for insects, and a climate moderator that breaks up wind, provides shade, and increases humidity. When it falls, it becomes a nursery log for new seedlings, and it decomposes to feed the soil. Likewise, we can do what permaculturists call stacking functions with each element of our garden design. This principle is perfect for gardeners with limited resources. A little creative thought can help us save a ton of effort when we find ways to achieve multiple goals at once. A daily walk for health purposes can be combined with our daily garden observation. Trees grown as a windbreak can be coppiced to produce straight poles for trellising. Flowers that brighten up the vegetable garden can also serve as habitat for helpful ladybugs. Mulch suppresses weeds, reduces fungal disease, feeds the soil, and improves its ability to absorb water. We can think about this principle in terms of our overall activities too. Try this. How can you combine your gardening with other parts of your life? Can it become a social activity with a friend or a loved one? Can the garden be a space for daily therapeutic activities like journaling or brain training or stretches? The more we can connect the various parts of our lives, the more they'll feel like a cohesive whole instead of an overwhelming to-do list. I used a practice called hugel culture to achieve a long list of goals. My hugelbait, that's a mound of dead wood designed to decompose into soil while plants grow on top of it, blocks the prevailing northwesterly wind from hitting my garden full force. It uses waste wood from a pile left by my landlords, and it produces rich soil, which is a resource that's pretty scarce on my compact clay property. The hugelbait supports a built-in trellis, which saves me from making post holes in the aforementioned clay and its steep sides create multiple microclimates that are either cooler and more shaded or warmer and more sheltered than other parts of my garden. Building the hugelbait was a big project and I did need help to finish, but it rewards me again and again year after year. The ninth principle is use small and slow solutions. Think about a show on HGTV where a crew installs a new garden in a single day. They dig out the yard and pour on huge quantities of soil and mulch. They pack flower beds with mature plants and pay top dollar for older trees to achieve that instant wow factor. The whole business requires a huge outlay of money, human energy, and machinery. Permaculture takes the opposite approach. Permaculturists are always looking for the smallest change that can produce the greatest effect. Importing soil is a fast fix, but it can cause more problems down the road if it's contaminated with an herbicide or with invasive jumping worms. An alternate solution might be to plant a cover crop and then chop it down to let it compost in place. It will take longer, but it will also build health into your soil. And it's an approach that can be scaled up without breaking the bank. Small, slow solutions often require less strenuous activity. Take sheet mulching, for example. It's a technique that combines weed suppression with soil building, hello stacking functions, and saves you from having to remove sod before you build a new garden bed. Instead of laboring with a shovel, you put down cardboard or newspaper and add layers of carbon-rich and nitrogen-rich mulch. It does take preparation to gather the materials, and there are many steps to layering them, but the whole process is gentle on the gardener's body. As somebody who has to keep my heart rate low, that's a big plus for me. I practice something called integrated pest management. Instead of reaching for a pesticide when I see a cluster of aphids, I take a step back and look at the bigger picture. 
Insects attack plants that have their own defenses weakened, so I look for other stressors that might be acting on the plant. Is the soil around its roots too hot? I can add some mulch. Is it wilting in the sun? I can rig up some shade cloth. And if it needs more nutrients or more regular watering, I can address that. Once a plant's needs are met, it can use its own tricks to deter insects, like releasing unpleasant tasting compounds. In fact, if I find aphids on a healthy looking plant, I usually leave them alone. I plant flowers every year to make ladybug habitat, but they're not gonna show up for the flowers alone. A nice buffet of juicy aphids is exactly what I need to have the ladybugs come and stay. For the rest of the summer, they'll keep the aphid population in check. This slow solution is way better for my health and the gardens, and it's a lot less work than waging constant war on insects. The tenth principle is use and value diversity. For anyone involved in regenerative agriculture, valuing diversity is a given. We understand these days that the more different kinds of crops we grow, the more resilient our system is. If one kind of grain is sensitive to drought, there are five others that can withstand it. If one apple falls prey to disease, other kinds are resistant. Even better, mixing multiple species together can reduce how vulnerable each of them is individually. The word for this is polyculture, and polycultures create healthier soils that hold water longer, and they make it harder for specialized pest insects to find their favorite foods. A potato bug in the middle of a field of 30 different kinds of plants is going to have a lot harder time finding other potato bugs and getting down to the business of making even more of them than one that finds itself in the middle of a 30-acre potato farm. There are plenty of reasons why a gentle gardener should value diversity. If our health is unreliable, we can expect our garden to be stressed by neglect at some point in the season, so growing lots of different plants can show us which ones can survive going it alone for a while. Besides, if we want to support our bodies with a wide range of nutrients, growing lots of different plants is a perfect way to do that. Not to mention the effort will save managing pests and disease because we've camouflaged their target plants in a confusing mixture of other sights and smells. I grow at least eight different kinds of leafy green in my garden because it is way too much effort to make sure that a single given one is always at its best. If the spinach didn't germinate, there's the mizuna. If the mizuna is bolting, there's the lettuce. If the lettuce has been devoured by slugs, there's the kale. And if the kale is still too small, there's the cress. And if all else really fails, there is always the lamb's quarters, which grows as a weed here, but is honestly the tastiest of the lot. The 11th principle is use edges and value the marginal. If you take a permaculture design course, your instructor will point out an intriguing phenomenon, one that you might have observed your whole life without ever really paying attention to it. In nature, the greatest diversity of life happens in places where things overlap. Where the light of the meadow meets the shelter of the forest, we find berry bushes and everything that eats them. Where the life-giving ocean meets the warm beach, we find tide pools. At the edge of the river, insects thrive on plants that are drinking deep from the water that cradles fish that leap out to swallow the insects. Even in human spaces, trade routes have traditionally been extra vibrant with the commingling of different cultures. Permaculturists encourage this phenomenon, which is why in permaculture designs, you'll see lots of curving lines and keyhole shapes rather than straight lines that move quickly from point A to point B. It's why pond edges curve in and out, creating sheltered spaces where land animals drink and aquatic creatures find nourishment. Using edges and valuing the marginal is fundamental to accessible garden design too. If your mobility is limited, how are you going to make sure you can reach everything you need to? The more edge you have in your paths, the more vantage points you have to reach everything within your growing spaces. In a metaphorical sense, we also know that designing for the most marginalized, in this case for our own disabled bodies, maximizes the usefulness of a space for all people. And in that process of problem solving and experimenting to achieve full accessibility, we accomplish innovations that would otherwise never have occurred. In my garden, I grow my vegetables mere feet away from a mix of grasses and wildflowers that reaches nearly to my chest. Not far beyond that is the edge of the forest. It's a bit of a pain when grass or blackberries pop up between my tomatoes, but I wouldn't trade it. The forest gives me abundant leaves for mulch. 
The field plants shelter native bees and butterflies. Small predators feel safe hunting pesky rodents there, and the local birds provide free fertilizer. Being in this edge space saves me plenty of work in pollinator attraction, pest management, and soil enhancement. And it's a wholesome, healthy place for me to spend my time too. The twelfth principle is creatively use and respond to change. Change is inevitable in any system that involves living things, weather, and time. Trees age and cast larger shadows. Perennials mature and fill out. Soil becomes richer as each year's mulch decomposes. Because the process of observation never ends in permaculture, change shouldn't come as a surprise, but it should always come as an opportunity. If heavy feeding plants aren't thriving where they used to, it might be time to plant a cover crop there to replenish the soil. If trees are dying because of pressures that come with climate change, it might be time to plant some resilient species from a little further south. As gentle gardeners, practicing this openness to change, to learning from it and adapting to it, is especially important. We know that change can happen within us too. Our condition might improve or deteriorate. A procedure could cause an interruption. Our mobility or our sensory needs might change from day to day. We can prepare ourselves by observing with curiosity and without self-judgment, and always adapting in ways that serve our needs. I used to grow a lot of pole beans and bush beans. Then, because of dietary changes I had to make, I stopped growing them. Productivity among my other plants fell off sharply that year. I can't guarantee that it was because of the loss of the nitrogen-fixing services of those beans, but it's a fair guess. The next summer, I grew beans again and let a lot of them decompose into the soil. An offering from me to Mother Nature in exchange for the lessons she teaches me year after year. So those are the 12 principles. They've been discussed and debated and written about for decades, and I don't think we're going to stop finding new interpretations and applications anytime soon. For me, they've been instrumental both in conceptualizing my relationship with the landscape around me and for conceptualizing my own inner landscape. If you found the insights in this video useful, I invite you to check out my ebook, Gentle Gardening, A Low Energy Guide for Uncooperative Bodies. It was written to help you figure out what a sustainable garden looks like for you, and to avoid the traps of grief and guilt that spring up when our execution doesn't match our expectations. There's a preview and more details at the link below. Either way, I leave you with a sincere wish that your gentle garden will nourish you as much as you do it.